Hello and welcome back to Be A Loser. We've been taking a deep look into the different macronutrients and how they affect us from a dietary standpoint. And in this video, we'll continue that discussion with one of the most hotly debated macros, fat. Even today, I think most people believe that eating fat will not only make you fat, but clog your arteries, raise your cholesterol, and cause you to die of a heart attack. Seriously, every show I watch on TV, be it a sitcom, drama, or the news, still seems to blame fat for heart disease and implies that eating lean meats and low-fat vegetables and grains will counter the obesity epidemic and reduce CHD. But haven't we been doing that for going on 50 years? Has the obesity epidemic subsided? Um, no. Has the occurrence of heart attacks decreased? Um, no. In fact, obesity rates are higher than they've ever been. Heart disease is the number one cause of death in the United States. And don't get me started on exercise. Just watch my video on it. I think most people watching this are proponents of a high-fat diet. But hopefully there are many watching who are trying to find out for themselves the truth about fat and whether or not it really is as evil as we're led to believe. So let's look closely at exactly how fat affects the body, which fats are good and which fats are bad, and show once and for all why we shouldn't fear fat, but love it instead. As we've already seen in a previous video, it was Dr. Ansel Key's seven country study that paved the road for the diet heart hypothesis. Now, feel free to watch or rewatch that video for the specifics. But the main issue was that Dr. Keyes was drawing on a conclusion based on observational data, meaning he was looking for correlations between heart disease and certain data. The problem is that these correlations can be interpreted in many ways to support many theories. Let's remember that hypothesis means educated guess. In the study, saturated fat, that's animal fat, did have a correlation to heart disease, but so did animal protein. Vegetable fats, unsaturated fats, had no correlation. But as we'll see in a moment, the types of vegetable fats that people were eating during this study were very, very different than those we've been eating for the past 30 plus years. But another conclusion could be drawn from this data as well. As Dr. Fung states, perhaps the consumption of high amounts of animal products was actually a marker of industrialization. Countries with higher levels of industrialization typically eat more meat and dairy products. Industrialization is considered a part of westernization. And since all of these dietary diseases fall under the broad spectrum of Western diseases, wouldn't it follow that we could simply say industrialized diseases? The real problem is that many hypotheses could come from this observational study. Well, perhaps it really was saturated fat, or maybe animal fat, or animal protein. Maybe it was total protein, or maybe it was total carbohydrate, or maybe it was industrialization. But instead, as we know from history, we got the diet heart hypothesis. And many, many people today still follow this hypothesis from 1970. The problem is that it's very flawed. So let's break it down and discuss some of those flaws. First off, there was no correlation between total serum cholesterol and heart disease. None. <laughs> let, me, let me say that again. The hypothesis that tells you that total cholesterol will lead to heart disease. 
the basis for all your blood tests targeting CVD shows no correlation between your total cholesterol and heart disease. And before you start naysaying, this was corroborated by other studies. So they decided to break cholesterol into good HDL and bad LDL in order to keep the ball rolling. The problem with that is that dietary interventions typically raise or lower both of these at the same time. The ultimate conclusion was that low HDL did not actually cause heart disease, it was only a marker for it. So many conclusions can be drawn from this. Exercise, olive oil, quitting smoking, all increase HDL. Maybe some or all of these also lower the risk of heart disease. But the scientists of the day were insistent that it was dietary saturated fat and that fat alone that was the culprit. So they turned to another massive study that we've discussed as well, the Framingham study. And remember what that study showed? Yep, no correlation between saturated fat intake, serum cholesterol, and heart disease. And that's precisely why you've never heard of it. They buried it because it didn't support their hypothesis. However, Dr. Michael Eads actually found a copy of the original study and in his notes made these statements. No association between percent of calories from fat and serum cholesterol level was shown, nor between ratio of plant fat to animal fat intake and serum cholesterol level. There is, in short, no suggestion of any relation between diet and the subsequent development of CHD in the study group. Well, that should have served as the nail in the coffin for the hypothesis, right? I mean, no association between animal or vegetable fat? Come on! But no, the scientists persisted and gave us a nice, low-fat diet along with the side of obesity and type 2 diabetes. And for the next 50 years, no study could find a relationship between dietary fat and serum cholesterol. Now another problem with this hypothesis was its use of nutritionism. Now what this means is that scientists believe they know enough about food to break it down into ratios of fat, protein, and carbohydrate. Using this flawed line of thinking, Dr. Keyes made the statement that all saturated fats, all unsaturated fats, and all cholesterol are the same. Now I know it sounds reasonable, I suppose, but if we use that same logic elsewhere, it's comical how obviously flawed it actually is. So if I said, well, spinach and sugar are the same thing because they're both carbohydrates, or hot dogs and grass-fed steaks are the same because they're both protein. That sounds ridiculous, right? <laughs> okay, what, what if you use that same logic about people? Well, then you'd be wildly racist. I mean, saying that my friend is African-American, so he must be good at basketball because LeBron James is African-American, is obviously just ignorant. Stanley, of course. I'm sorry? Um, what do you play, center? Why, of course. What's uh, that supposed to mean? But even so, trials were undertaken for more than two decades with tens of thousands of subjects to prove this high dietary fat to heart disease hypothesis, and yet still show the exact opposite. Now, as we moved closer to our modern age and saturated fat was still believed to be the culprit here, some light was shed on two fats being grouped together in these original studies. Those fats were saturated fat and trans fat. Now, I'm sure you've heard of trans fat, but what is it? Well, trans fats are created from polyunsaturated vegetable oils. Now, with the exception of olives and coconuts, most vegetables are not particularly oily. It takes a lot of processing to get oil out of corn or soybeans, and so when the oil is extracted, it's missing hydrogen and is thus polyunsaturated. 
The flip side to this is saturated fat, which is filled with or saturated with hydrogen. Because of this, saturated fats tend to be more stable and solid at room temperature, while polyunsaturated fats are unstable and thus liquid at room temperature and quicker to become rancid. Well, in 1902, Wilhelm Norman realized that you could actually introduce hydrogen into polyunsaturated fats using hydrogenation catalysts. In essence, this turned a polyunsaturated fat into a saturated fat and made it semi-solid at room temperature. This had added benefit to food companies as it had better texture and spreadability. They labeled it partially hydrogenated vegetable oil, but you'll recognize its true name, trans fat. This stuff was great for the food industry. Spreadable, palatable, great for frying, and best of all, inexpensive. Manufacturers could use leftover soybeans from cattle feed, process it, do a little chemistry to add hydrogen, and boom, there you go. Cheap, delicious trans fat. And in 1911, it became known as Crisco. Any of you have a tub of that in your pantry? Yes, this hydrogenated oil replaced lard, the fat that's rendered from cooking pork products. And companies were quick to label it as a wholesome and healthy vegetable product. But as we'll see, just because something is made from vegetables, it isn't necessarily healthy. No, it's made in a lab, not in nature. So you decide if it's good for you or not. Circus peanut anyone? Uh, that would be a hard pass for me. Now, as we reached the 1960s and Ansel Keys was gracing the cover of Time magazine, telling everyone how deadly saturated fats were for them, animal products containing saturated fats were replaced by chemically processed trans fats labeled as vegetable oils. At the same time, butter was being pointed to as unhealthy as well. So margarine incorporated trans fat and created a wholly artificial food. It was in 1990 that Dutch researchers determined that trans fats raise LDL, the bad, and lower HDL, the good, cholesterols. So this was the beginning of the end for trans fats. It was estimated that a 2% increase in ingested trans fat would result in a 23% increase in the risk of heart disease. What were we thinking? Well, the problem was that trans fats are saturated fats, but they're not naturally occurring saturated fats like lard and other animal fats, and the two couldn't really be much more different. But they were all lumped together by scientists, including Dr. Keyes, and the rest is history, as most of you with fat phobia can attest. So, now that we knew that trans fats were different than saturated fats, a closer look was required. A study was done using data from the Framingham study and looked at margarine consumption for 20 years. And the results were a surprise. Well, to those who bought into the diet heart hypothesis, which was most everyone. Margarine was touted as being heart healthy, but the more of it people ate, the more heart attacks they had. And what about the now villainous butter? The stuff that would clog your arteries? Well, the more butter people ate, the fewer heart attacks they had. What the hell, right? <laughs> That's exactly the opposite of what, of what doctors to this day will tell you is supposed to happen. So this pretty clearly shows that trans fats are really, really bad for you, and saturated fats, well, they aren't so bad after all. And since previous studies, including Dr. Key's seven country study, lumped them together, well then the data from which our heart healthy diet was founded upon would have drawn incorrect conclusions. So a study was undertaken to look at the effects of dietary fats excluding trans fats. This study analyzed the data from the Nurses Health Study, which included over 8,000 women participants. They were divided into five groups, 
based on total fat intake, and then assessed for their risk of CAD, coronary artery disease. When trans fat effects were accounted for and removed, the results were as follows. Total fat intake was not significantly related to the risk of coronary disease. And as a side note, it was also concluded that dietary cholesterol had no effect on serum cholesterol levels. This was also discussed in the History of the American Diet video. Okay, so in a more recent study in 2009, all available trials were used for data points and found no link between total fat and heart disease. Saturated animal fats didn't increase the risk for heart disease. Polyunsaturated vegetable fats didn't decrease the risk for heart disease. There was just simply no correlation between dietary fat and heart disease. And as far as obesity, there was no correlation between dietary fats and weight gain. Eating fat doesn't make you fat, and it doesn't give you heart disease. So if saturated fat isn't bad for us, well, could it possibly be good? Well, in 1996, a study set out to test just that. In this study, over 43,000 health professionals were studied over 10 years with their risk of heart attack compared to consumption of saturated fat. There were once again five groups based on fat consumption. And what we expect to find based on 50 years of rhetoric is exactly opposite to the facts. Those who had the lowest intake of saturated fats had the highest risk for heart disease. And if we look at another large aspect of cardiovascular disease, that being stroke, the study divided the men into groups based on intake of sodium, fat, and protein. Now, sodium or salt is often pointed to for causing high blood pressure and leading to stroke and heart disease. But the study found no correlation. Those who ate the most salt had no more risk than those eating the least. And as far as protein and fat, well, the more one ate of them, the lower the risk of heart disease. Now, let's not make the same mistake here that Dr. Keyes did, all right? These are correlation studies, so they can't tell us if fat is actually protective against heart disease or stroke, but they can show that they are not harmful. However, the Framingham study, which divided groups by dietary fat intake, showed that those eating the most fat suffered the least strokes. High fat intake was indeed protective against strokes. And if we look more closely at the data, we can break the total fat into saturated and polyunsaturated fats. And as it turns out, saturated fats, animal fats, are protective, while polyunsaturated fats, vegetable fats, are not protective. To be fair, monounsaturated fats, like olive oil, remember, one of the only naturally oily vegetables, well, those fats are also protective. So this now begs the question, what's the difference between these types of vegetable fat, polyunsaturated and monounsaturated, that makes one protective and the other not protective? And what then makes saturated fats protective? Well, omega-6 fatty acids are very low in saturated animal fats, and thus omega-3 is quite high. The opposite is true of vegetable oils, such as corn oil, which is mostly polyunsaturated fat. These are very high in omega-6 and have little or no omega-3. As our diet changed historically from high amounts of saturated fats to high amounts of polyunsaturated fats, the consequence, which was intended by the way, was that we were now greatly increasing our intake of omega-6 while lowering our intake of omega-3. So why does this matter for us? Well, omega-6 is a type of polyunsaturated fat that's broken down into fatty acids that are highly inflammatory. Inflammation is generally not good. So if I asked you what causes plaque buildup leading to atherosclerosis, you'd probably say, oh, well, that's due to cholesterol in the blood clogging up the arteries. Unfortunately, you'd be wrong. 
That hypothesis for the cause of plaque buildup has been disproven for at least 30 years. In reality, it's inflammation and thrombosis, blood clots, of the arterial walls that cause the response of plaque buildup. So we can see once more that we've been focusing on the body's response, plaque buildup, to the underlying injury, which is the inflammation. So if inflammation is the cause of atherosclerosis, then ingesting inflammatory fats such as omega-6 is probably not particularly good. But Mother Nature is a beautiful chemist, as we've seen from my carbohydrate video. In, in this case, she's done it once again. Omega-3 is, in essence, the counter or antidote to omega-6. Omega-3 reduces thrombosis as it plays a role in platelet clustering and blood viscosity. It's believed that we evolved eating a balanced ratio one to one of omega-6 to omega-3, but our current Western diet is considered to be closer to a 15 to one omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. We're seriously overeating omega-6 and seriously undereating omega-3. Once again, the proof is in application here. The Inuit people, who we often discuss on this channel, were shown to have a very low incidence of heart disease, even though they ate high amounts of fat. In fact, all populations who eat mainly fish are typically low in the heart disease categories. This, combined with some studies, show that high amounts of omega-3 can remove the harmful omega-6 from cell walls, unless, of course, you're overeating omega-6 and undereating omega-3 by a ratio of 15 to 1 or higher. So how did our ratio of these dietary fats get so out of whack? And the answer is in a word, industrialization. In the early 1900s, the expeller press was invented. Expeller pressing is a mechanical method for extracting oil from raw materials, such as nuts. The materials are squeezed under high pressure in a single step. Friction causes them to heat up. In the case of harder nuts, which require higher pressures, the materials can exceed temperatures of 120 degrees Fahrenheit, 49 degrees Celsius. This invention allowed for vast processing of oils from nuts and vegetables that were not particularly oily in nature. At the same time, livestock farms were becoming more industrialized as well. Cattle are grazing animals that typically eat large amounts of grass. Industrialization of their feed led to cows being fed corn instead of grass. This had the benefit to ranchers of fattening the cows, but it has the side effect of increasing the omega-6 content of their meat. So you can see that now everything we were eating, from meat to oils to grains, was high in omega-6. In a meta-analysis of all studies up to 2013, Dr. Ramsden looked at polyunsaturated fat consumption. He divided subjects based on their total consumption of these fats. Upon detailed inspection, the results showed that omega-3 consumption was associated with decreased risk of CHD, chronic heart disease, while consumption of omega-6 actually increased the risk. So not all polyunsaturated fats are the same. The more processed they are, the higher their omega-6 levels, the more detrimental they are to our health. There was one randomized long-term trial designed to show the effects of switching from saturated fats to polyunsaturated fats. It randomized roughly 9,000 psychiatric inmates to follow recommended heart-healthy guidelines. So they were going from their diet containing 39% fat 18% of it saturated, 5% polyunsaturated, and 16% monounsaturated, to a diet of 38% fat, that being 9% saturated, 15% polyunsaturated, and 14% monounsaturated. They achieved this by eating wonderfully artificial foods, such as egg substitute and margarine, along with low-fat beef. Over four and a half years, they could show no benefits for heart disease. However, they did demonstrate a difference in total mortality. 
Yep. The new low saturated fat, high polyunsaturated fat diet had a higher all mortality rate. Winning. <laughs> so this shows why polyunsaturated fats are so bad for our health. But why are saturated fats apparently so healthy for us? Well, a study published in 2004 sought to explain just that. It examined the angiographic progression of coronary disease in 235 women with established heart disease. For those of you who don't know, angiography is a procedure in which dye is injected into the arteries of the heart, allowing for blockages to be seen via x-ray. The study looked at the diets of the women and divided them based on fat intake. Ultimately, their fat intake had no effect on their heart disease. If anything, those eating the highest amount of fat had slightly fewer blockages. However, those who ate the highest amount of carbohydrates had the highest level of heart blockages. So what's the takeaway? Well, once again, those eating the Heart Association approved heart healthy diet were getting heart disease, and those eating the taboo high fat diet were not. The scientists took the study a step further by dividing the groups to look at naturally saturated fat ingestion to determine if these were detrimental to health as predicted by the diet heart hypothesis. And what did they find? Well, those eating the highest amounts of saturated fats had regression of their heart blockages. Their heart disease was improving by eating natural saturated fats. But they didn't stop there. They looked at polyunsaturated fat consumption. Remember the heart healthy made from vegetables processed oils? Yeah. <laughs> and those with the highest consumption of these fats had progressively worse heart blockages. Yes, Dr. Keyes, it's opposite day. Saturated fats are good, polyunsaturated fats are bad. Now, I want to go ahead and pile on a little bit here. I mean, I've got decades of government mandated fat phobia that I have to crush, okay? So another study looked at over 29,000 subjects for a little over six and a half years. And once again, among the women, Increasing saturated fat intake significantly lowered risk of dying of heart disease. Another study that followed over 58,000 Japanese men and women for a little over 14 years looked at the relationship between heart disease and stroke to fat intake. And what did they find? You guessed it, eating more saturated fat protects against heart disease and stroke. To quote, total mortality was inversely associated with intakes of saturated fatty acids. And to quote Dr. Fung, saturated fat is not bad for you. It's good for you. And recently there have been several meta-analyses of all trials to date. One of them analyzed 21 studies totaling almost 350,000 patients. And it concluded, there is no significant evidence for concluding that dietary saturated fat is associated with an increased risk of CHD, coronary heart disease. Additionally, there was a small yet significant protective effect on stroke. So it seems pretty clear that saturated fat has health benefits for heart disease and stroke. These are two major health concerns in the United States and globally. But just short of those is the obesity epidemic that we're seeing coupled with type 2 diabetes. Now as we know, if you follow basically any of my series, carbohydrates, mainly refined carbohydrates, stimulate insulin the most. Protein stimulates insulin moderately and fat stimulates almost no insulin secretion. 
As you also know, insulin is the main driver of obesity and type 2 diabetes through hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance. But the question is, why does the body metabolize fat so differently from carbs and protein? Okay, well, let's break it down and start with the ever maligned carbohydrates. So carbohydrates, as we know, are chains of glucose or polysaccharides. A majority of these are known as amylopectin, which is broken down into three categories that are very eloquently named amylopectin A, B, and C. Amylopectin A is the easiest to digest and is typically found in bread. Amylopectin B is the mid-range of digestibility and found in bananas. And amylopectin C is the most difficult to digest and found in beans. So if you look at the glycemic index of these carbs, the difference in these polysaccharides is very apparent. So bread has a high GI score, while beans have a low GI score. Remember, it's, it's the insulin secretion that we're interested in because that's what determines weight gain. It's not the carbohydrate itself. And that's why not all carbs are created equal. So let's follow the carb to its metabolic conclusion. This is a little bit sciencey, so I'll try my best to make it easy to follow. Now, the amylopectin is broken down into glucose molecules, and it's then sent through the bloodstream to the liver. The liver then turns the glucose molecules back into chains known as glycogen. The problem is that the liver has limited storage space, so the rest of the glucose is sent to the fat cells and turned into fat through the process of de novo lipogenesis. The fat that's generated is highly saturated and increases the levels of saturated fat in the blood, which is a marker of heart disease. So I can imagine there's some confusion here. This whole video I've been telling you how saturated fat is protective of heart disease. But remember, that's dietary saturated fat. The fat created by de novo lipogenesis is from dietary carbohydrates. Okay, so protein. Now protein is made up of chains of amino acids which are broken down and absorbed to build muscle. If you bodybuild or strength train, then you need a high amount of dietary protein. But for those of us normal people who don't, we only need a moderate amount of dietary protein. So, if we overeat protein, which is really easy to do, then there are leftover amino acids. These amino acids can either be converted to glucose, ketones, or both. The excess amino acids are sent through the bloodstream to the liver and converted to glucose through gluconeogenesis. This stimulates insulin, glucagon, and incretins. More on incretins in my protein video. But it's important to note that not all proteins are created equal either. Excess consumption of animal protein is associated with a greater increase in the risk of T2D than an excess of plant protein. That's just more food for thought. Nice pun, I know. So finally, dietary fat. When we eat fat, it does not need to go through the liver. So, insulin is not required. If you're eating pure fat, then it's simply used for fuel. When you eat fat, your body burns fat. Remember that your body has two sources of fuel. It can burn sugar or it can burn fat. It cannot burn both. The systems are separate and do not interact. When insulin levels are high, then the body runs on glucose and stores fat. No need to use the fat for fuel when there's plenty of ingested glucose rolling around in there. But when you eat a diet low in carbs and protein, there isn't as much glucose to burn, and so the body will enter its fat burning mode. Now, a good analogy from Dr. Fung is that stored fat is like a backup generator, and the electricity to your house is like glucose. So if you have electricity, then there's no reason to run the generator. But 
If there's no electricity coming in, then the generator kicks on to provide you with energy. If the electricity, glucose, comes back on, then the generator, fat, shuts off. It's one or the other, folks. Eat a lot of carbs and protein, get fat. Eat a lot of fat, get thin. So let's put this all together. It's a lot of information, but boils down to something very simple. First and foremost is that eating natural fat is far healthier than processed fat, just as it is for carbs and protein. Processing and refining foods removes any protective qualities inherent in them. In essence, we process out the antidote and leave in the poison, metabolically speaking. In carbs, we take out the fiber and leave in the sugar, bad sugar. In fat, we take out the omega-3 and leave in the omega-6. Hello, heart disease. So make life simple. Eat more fat, eat less processed food, lower your risk for heart disease, stroke, obesity, and type 2 diabetes. Need I say more? <laughs> That's all for this one. We made it. Please help get the word out by subscribing, liking the videos, and sharing them. And keep your comments and questions coming. Really, folks, that absolutely makes my day. All of what I do with this channel is for all of you. So let's eat better, live better, and get healthier together. As always, thanks so much for watching. And until next time, keep being a loser.